It's 1894 in the Scottish mountains. A young 24-year-old by the name of Charles Thompson Rees Wilson has just begun work at an observatory at the summit of the mountain named Ben Nevis, the highest summit in the United Kingdom. Wilson, recently fascinated by the physical sciences after attending Sydney Sussex College, wants to become a meteorologist and has followed his passion to the summit, studying clouds and their properties. Upon working at the summit, Wilson becomes fascinated by a strange phenomenon, rings in the clouds resembling a circular rainbow with a shadow of the observer in its middle. This phenomenon, now known as a glory and Brock inspector, leaves Wilson in awe. He decides, after seeing these glories, that he wants to recreate his own in the lab. Little did he know, however, that what he was about to create would not just help him study the properties of clouds, but also would end up transforming the world of physics forever. Wilson got to work on a chamber that would allow him to expand moist air to observe its properties. He successfully finished a primitive model by the end of 1895, just one year after he began work at Ben Nevis and began observations. The purpose of the expanding chamber was to give the volume of air a certain saturation of water vapor and then expand it adiabatically so that the expansion causes a drop in the temperature of the present air. It was already well known at this time that absorption of vapors and solubility of solutions increases as the temperature of the air or solvent increases, so the goal here was to create a certain absorption level of water vapor in the air and then decrease the temperature of the air so that there was more vapor in the air than could be absorbed. This effect, known today as supersaturation, would allow for easy condensation and mist formation so that Wilson could easily study the properties of mists and clouds. Upon creating these conditions with this chamber, however, he quickly noticed a peculiar effect. The mist created from vapor condensing on dust wasn't the only kind of vapor being created. There were also sharp trails of mist being created, appearing very quickly every so often, shooting across the chamber, spanning a few centimeters, and then dissipating after a few seconds. Wilson's hypothesis for this phenomenon, a bold one at the time, was that water vapor in the air was condensing on atoms passing through the chamber. The reason that this hypothesis was so bold was because no forms of ionizing radiation had yet been discovered, and therefore there was nothing to explain why water would condense on some nuclei rather than others, let alone any nuclei at all. This would quickly change, however, as many forms of radiation slowly came to light. X-rays in 1896, alpha and beta radiation in 1899, and gamma radiation in 1900. Discoveries like these showed that air molecules could be ionized, acting as an electrical attraction for polarized molecules such as water and alcohol. These discoveries offered an explanation for what made certain nuclei so special that vapor could condense on them. Wilson continued his research on ionization nuclei and these water vapor tracks from 1895 until 1900, but his other studies and obligations caused a stunt in this research on the topic. It wouldn't be until the year 1911 when he would improve his invention and dub it the cloud chamber. Using his cloud chamber, he successfully photographed and labeled alpha particles as well as beta particles, or electrons, which he called little wisps and threads of clouds. The cloud chamber would continually go through a series of modifications and improvements until the year 1923, when he would introduce his version of the perfected cloud chamber. It was in this year that he published two papers on tracking clouds of electrons, citing a technique that was almost instantly picked up by scientists around the world and led to a series of fascinating discoveries. The chamber would be used to experimentally prove the Compton effect shortly after its invention. Patrick Blackett would later improve the chamber further and use it to confirm the existence of the proton. Carl David Anderson used it to demonstrate the existence of the positron. Blackett and Occhialini used it to visually demonstrate the concept of pair creation and annihilation of electrons and positrons. So many new discoveries came from just one invention because of just how much easier it made visualizing and understanding atomic and subatomic particles and how they interact with one another. 
The invention was so revolutionary that Ernest Rutherford himself called it the most original and wonderful instrument in scientific history. Wilson won the Nobel Prize in 1927 for his method of making the paths of electrically charged particles visible by condensation of vapor, sharing his prize with Arthur Compton. Wilson spent his years, along with the development of his cloud chamber, lecturing, but due to a stutter, he tended to often receive poor reception. He did, however, make significant contributions to the understanding of atmospheric and thunderstorm electricity simultaneously with his cloud chamber development. Possibly the most astounding part of this saga is that Wilson wasn't primarily a physicist, but rather a meteorologist. He made the chamber wanting to study atmospheric effects, but got a much different result out of his efforts. And yet, Wilson had his raw, ingenious nature and a background in physical sciences that allowed him to capitalize on the strange phenomenon he discovered. Despite his passion for meteorology, he continued development on his device, working in two fields simultaneously, and ended up contributing to the field of physics far more than even in his main field. Thanks to Wilson, human understanding of atomic and subatomic particles has vastly increased, and the visualization of such particles not only serves as an unveiling of hidden nature, but also as a source of inspiration and wonder for the hidden beauty of our universe. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Click here if you want to see more scientific progress made during this time period. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.